Okay. Is that, is that we turn the light off, please? All right, what, what did I ask you to talk about drivers? When they first got introduced, and oh, okay. You want like a half page uh, when they got introduced. I think I said one to two pages. Didn't I? I mean, it's in it's it's typed somewhere. <laughs> I can log into Angel and, and, and see it. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I wanted you to look at when drivers were initially introduced. Um, seem to remember what was the asking? What was the motivation behind them? What was the actual question? So I have to look it up. You said uh, one to two page to find history software drivers. What was the motivation behind it? What was the gateway drug? Oh, that's right, gateway drug. Love that. I love that phrase. So, what was that? What did you What did you come up with for the gateway drug? Why did they all of a sudden decide, hey, we need expandable operating systems? We need operating systems that support new hardware moving forward. Did you do this assignment, Dane? I totally forgot about it. Oh my gosh. You get a paper though, don't worry. You don't do hard assignments, you don't do easy assignments, you don't do just like here, like spit where, some I, words on a page assignments. I spent like a half an hour at Google just trying to find any information about the history of drivers and I couldn't find anything. Oh. Not even Wikipedia. Wikipedia was pretty useless. There, there is no way that you did a search on drivers on Google and found nothing. Because everything was device drivers. Everything was about your phone drivers. Was it about device drivers? Yeah, that's what that's what we're talking about. Well, were you, were you were trying to write a paper on screwdrivers or something? It would, it would always go back to like your phone and updating your drivers on your phone. And not Did you do a search for history of device drivers? Yes. I will show it to. I guarantee that there was plenty of information out there on device drivers. Was there not? <laughs> I think you'd get a wall of search results. <laughs> All right, so when were they first introduced? Let's go. Let's start with that. Okay, did you just find that now? Okay. Why? What was the gateway drug? By the way, Skippy, he did not spend a half hour to give the answer to one question. There's nothing on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the answer to every paper I write. <laughs> so what was the gateway drug? Why? Why did they start creating drivers? What was the motivation behind it? Today we think about drivers for video cards and things like that. Was that the motivation? Was video cards the thing that said, well, they're going to keep coming out with higher and higher power video cards, so we better create some way that we don't have to release a brand new operating system every single time a new video card comes out. Okay, I'm going to say no. What was the motivation? Is that what you wrote for the motivation? You just not write the motivation? I couldn't find anything about the motivation. It's not so much finding something about the motivation, it's about reading the resources and discerning what the motivation was. Is that the, I mean, when I ask somebody to like write a paper, I mean, this is college, it's like a research paper, right? I mean, you're not going to just find the paper out there. It's like, well, let's go. Okay. <laughs> the reason I ask you to give me a critical, critical thinking is so you don't just go and download the paper from somewhere. I want to prove that you looked into a subject matter. Skippy Googled for 30 minutes, according to him. I'm guessing it was more like three minutes. I'd give you 20. If you Google for 20 minutes, you didn't find anything, that, then you are more stupid than I thought. 
<laughs> Which I guess would be a failure on my part. <laughs> it's a reflection on my poor judgment. <laughs> so what do you think? Based on what we read, what do you think the motivation was based on the timing? I think that it could have because uh, Windows and Windows NT were split. It said that they wanted to introduce a driver so that it could be portable between both operating systems. Okay. So maybe they didn't want to reinvent the wheel twice. Okay. What specifically were the things that, when they, when they said, let's introduce a driver, what, what were they talking about? What, what hardware did they want to give control over for that time period? So now we're kind of talking about a time period where when those operating systems were out, what was happening in the world of hardware? Because at that point, we're looking at that transition between computers were not really commonplace, but were, were not rare either. Somewhere in the middle. Most businesses had a computer of some type running DOS, and they had there was Microsoft Word. You know, from a DOS perspective, you type in you know, Word, press enter, and it would launch this blue screen that was a, um, you know, a word processor in DOS. That's how word processors used to be. Um, so they were already in business, and then you also probably had them starting to creep into the home. I think around this time we had a, um, uh, an Epson computer at the house, a company that makes printers now. So we had a computer made by Epson. It had the five and a quarter inch floppy floppy disk on it. Um, before that, we had a typewriter, but we had a fancy, fancy schmancy typewriter, the ones that had like a little LCD screen. So you would type out maybe three or four lines in a row, and then once you, you checked it and made sure it said what you wanted it to say, then you'd hit the button and it would type all it out real quick for you. So that way you didn't have to, you know, erase quite a bit and stuff, because they had, you know, they put basically white out on the page for you. But the, uh, um, that, was, that was the hybrid. That was the typewriter computer hybrid. Gave you a little LCD screen that let you type a little bit of stuff, a couple of lines. And then once you check, spell checked it and, and, and grammar checked it, then you hit the button and it just powered it onto the page. Okay, so, but at that time, I had an Epson computer. And when Windows came out, we had this 286SX25 megahertz computer. That was the... Uh, um, so a 286, this is an Intel processor. Before that, the Epson was probably an Intel x86. Uh, so that's like Intel processor number one. <laughs> that is like the fancy way of saying Intel processor number one. The SX was processor number two, um, let's say. And 25 megahertz, yes, megahertz, <laughs> 25 megahertz SX processor was uh, what we had in our machine. And uh, actually, what was, uh, here's the, the uh, my next machine after that was a 486DX2, um, 66 megahertz machine. But the DX processor versus the SX processor, was there was a major, major difference. And there was things that we take for granted today. That is, the DX had a math coprocessor. SX chip could not do math on its own. It needed a secondary processor to offload math to. Like the world back then was, was so different from a computing perspective. Okay, so we're talking back in that day when uh, a, a decent computer, you know, a five or six thousand dollar computer was a 25 megahertz machine with no math, with no math coprocessor, and that computer ran Windows. When I got it, it didn't have Windows on it. It had DOS on it. But then Windows came out, and I installed it on there. So during that time period, what kinds of devices do you think were... This is in 1990... Probably like 1990. Maybe 91, 92, somewhere, somewhere in that ballpark. Maybe 1992. So... Man, that's like 22 years ago. Is anybody 22 in here? Anybody older than 22 in here? 
We <laughs> like 35 back then. <laughs> I've been in school a long time. <laughs> Living off the tax dollars. Taking out student loans, just getting by. <laughs> there are professional students like that. They just have to keep a good standing in school and they just keep, uh, keep getting more and more degrees. Um, and you can get better loans for bachelor's degrees than you can for master's. That's why you have people who have multiple bachelor's degrees. They become professional students and just live off their student loans and live in the dorms forever. You have like 40-year-old guys. It's a decent, I mean, it's not a, it's a fairly good lifestyle instead of starting real life, I guess. Well, everything's relative. You know, when you're in school, you hate school and decide, oh, I can't wait till I get out into the, you know, the workforce and actually start doing real stuff and making real money. But then new complications come up with that. Like, you always think the grass is greener on the other side, right? You know, like now, sometimes I'll think back and say, you know what? Life was so simple when I was in school. The worst thing you had to worry about was, uh, you know, a, an exam or something like that. Or <laughs> a one to two page paper. Wow. You know how much easier homework assignments are today than they were when I was in school? And I bet you they were easier when I was in school than they were when my parents were in school. I mean, we've dumbed this stuff down so much. I mean, I was doing the stuff that you guys are doing now when I was, like, in diapers with those little tablet things that spoke words to you. That's like the assignments I give you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, during that time period, early 90s, let's say, what was going on in the world of computing? What do you think made computers popular? The internet. Uh, internet did not exist then. But you're not far off. The internet kind of started existing from a consumer perspective, perspective around 1995. Go ahead. Well, cer certainly, uh, I think a little bit before that is when they really started coming into the house, but you were still in that transition. You know, so early 90s, that's the point where, you know, amongst your neighbors and stuff, there was likely a couple of people with a computer. You know, that, that, but now, you just assume all your neighbors have at least a computer. Yeah. You know. or, or better? Even better. Oh, they better have a computer. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. I don't want stupid neighbors. <laughs> the only the first thing comes to mind, and this is going to be a Christian worldview thing. It's the whole, uh, um, yeah. What's the what's the what's the verse um, that deals with the don't point out the speck in somebody else's eye when you have a uh, was it a thorn in yours or I think there's some different translation for it. I think it's like wood chunk in yours or something like that. So basically you're saying you don't want your neighbors to be stupid when you're an idiot. It's, <laughs> that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible <laughs> I think loosely translated. <laughs> the Bible says, don't look down on others because you're stupider. More stupidest. More stupidest. <laughs> it's, it's only a half point. That was like a... You couldn't really remember the verse, though. Almost verbatim. No, I, I mean, I, I would pretty legit on that verse. I mean, that's pretty close. I, my interpretation might be somewhat, somewhat <laughs> kind of catty-cornered a little bit. Um, okay, so what was going on? So, so certainly we have some computers around, uh, um, you know, in the home. Maybe more importantly is they were becoming commonplace in business. That's maybe more important to the moral of the story. Um, very common in businesses. More and more and more businesses were getting computers in there. What do businesses require from their computers? So if you're a business in the early 90s, what, what, is your, what are you using a computer for? Something that a computer can do faster than a person, like calculations. Um, I mean, that... It's obviously a it's obviously a fair statement, but let's go even roll back a little bit more. What were what were businesses using before that? For I mean, do you think the early use of a computer was probably word processing? Before that, it was a typewriter, right? 
What did computer? What what did the computer do? It replaced the typewriter with a keyboard and monitor. That only when you were happy with it did you hit print. Why was that a good thing? What was bad about typewriters? They're loud. Okay, um, that, that's fair. You can't really edit your stuff unless you have if you had something like LCD screen that you could go back and even then you can't really go back to the top of the paper anymore. Yep. So. Uh, it was a one and done type thing, right? Now, I mean, they had white out, and even some of the fancier typewriters had built in. You can hit the backspace, and it would flip over to the other uh, uh, ink strip that had white out stuff on it, and actually do like perfect white out, if you will, by by putting the over the let's say you were backspacing an F, it would actually print an F in white out on top of the F that was already there. So it was as, as accurate of a whiteout as you could have gotten, right? Um, now, that's fine for most things. But let's say you were turning in a professional document that was really important. Would you want to turn something in that was covered with whiteout? Even if it was professionally done, even if it was great, perfect whiteout, you could still tell there was some whiteout on there. And more importantly, when you went and typed over whiteout, it you could tell something was a little off. They get a little crumbly, a little crumbly on the paper. So typewriters, especially if you were doing an important document, there were stories of people who retyped their paper five, six times until they had it as error-free as they could without too much whiteout. Wouldn't that be a nightmare? You guys are complaining about a one to two page paper, most of which you copied and pasted from the internet. Right? As opposed to, what if you had to type it six times? There was no internet. The idea of copying and pasting did not exist. Every letter came from your own hand. Copying and pasting meant you looked at a newspaper, looked at a book you got from the library, and you typed what you saw. Dane would just choose not to do the paper. Hey, look, if I can't copy from Wikipedia, I am not copying directly out of the book. I don't have time for that. You know, even my cheating must be efficient. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not wasting time on this crap. So, uh, typewriters had lots of problems, right? So now we get computers in there. So maybe today we don't necessarily view our computers as word processors. It's That's one of the functions it does. Clearly, it's not a function that most of us use often, <laughs> even when assigned a paper to write. Um, but the reality is we don't consider that the main function of a computer, likely today. When in the early days of business, it probably was the main function of the computer. But word processing only worked as well as you could print. Because ultimately you needed to get this stuff on paper, right? Because email didn't exist yet. So now you needed a printer. And you think typewriters are loud. Have you ever heard a dot matrix printer print? That would be an interesting YouTube video if we can find one. You'll be you'll be begging for a keyboard or for a typewriter. Dot matrix printer. Oh yeah. That takes a little bit more. Yes they do. Look at that. I remember having to peel the sides off before I turned the paper in. Let's get this thing printing. pages an hour. <laughs> so imagine printing out like a five or ten page paper. I mean, you go to work for the day. <laughs> so 
still think that's better than typewriter. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, our early printers were like that, and they were slow. Like in many in many cases, you had human beings that could type faster than the printer could print. It was probably at least close, but you know, point is, is that printers were not necessarily, you know, super fast or anything, and they were definitely really loud. Um, but having the computer for word processing was only as good as having the printer. Even though the printer was slow, even though the printer was loud, at least you didn't print until you had proofread your work. Would be the idea, right? So. You only fire it off to the printer that takes 20 minutes um, when you're actually ready to pull the trigger and print. Or now, what a, you know, we're lazy. We just write it real quick, don't even proofread it, print it, probably still don't proofread it, and then just turn it in. If we do proofread it, we take the printed out copy into the, you know, into the bathroom or whatever, proofread it in there, and then decide, well, are the number of errors worthwhile? What are you, what are you listening to? No idea. I have word open. <laughs> <laughs> he's typing his paper is what he's doing. Actually. I know. It's already late. It was due before class started. Talk about these, these students today. I'm going to get Gus in here with a box cutter. Make, a, make, make, an, make an example. I wonder if, like, in the Middle Ages, like, with education, that's, like, what they did. You know, making it, well, no, I mean, they probably weren't that creative. You know, but make an example from, you know, like, one student, like, somebody's got to be the fall guy. Like, day two of class, you know, somebody messes up just a little bit, you hang them. Yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, if you showed up to the first day of class, like, oh, you know, I just need to coast through this, blah, blah, blah. And some student, like, does a mediocre job and gets hung. Like, don't you probably take the rest of the class a little more seriously? <laughs> <Not show up>. <laughs> <laughs> they would send people out on horseback. Have to find me. <laughs> they have to find me first. <laughs> Cowering in the woods. <laughs> See, all these stupid laws have been created to protect protect the classroom for this kind of stuff. We really need to bring back some of that. I know, seriously. When I was in elementary school, the teachers were allowed to beat the crap out of us. I, got, I think I told you, I got, I got beat three times in first grade. What did you do? Eight crayons one of the times. She didn't like that. Yeah, did you? <laughs> they didn't just hit you. They grab you, drag you out of the room. You come out the door, you turn right. Go about 75 feet down the hall. There's this little tiny door on the left side. It's, a, it's like a storage room. You go in there, and that's where they keep staples and stuff like that. Hanging on the wall is the weapon. Specifically made for beating children. Has holes drilled in it. Um, you know, a switch. You know, made of, I don't know, oak or whatever was great for beating kids. There was one single light bulb, turn it on, and just beat the crap out of you in there. Probably hit, hit you 30, 40 times. Then drags you back into the classroom while you're still bawling. Doesn't say a thing. Then you have to sit there after class, and they call your mom in, and they yell at you in front of your mom after they beat the crap out of you earlier in the day. Did they do that like in middle school? Or that just elementary? Some point... Um, during my childhood is when they, some laws were passed. <laughs> yeah, no, I could see that. Yeah, once they got big enough. In middle school, I don't know if I would have been able to like stand for that. No, I, I, get, I know what you're saying. In school, you're kind of shocked and you're yeah. like, oh, this is weird. Mm -hmm. But then in middle school. At some like, point, you get yeah, big enough where happen. you're not going to just let somebody beat the crap out of you. No, I get, I get it. Right. Um. But also somewhere in there they changed the laws. I want to say that when I was in school, my parents had to specifically give them permission to hit me. Your parents loved you very much. Oh, it was common then. Oh. No, it wasn't like. Yeah, see, it, we, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying. And when he grew up, I mean, it was illegal. 
I mean, you have kids that have complained to the police about their getting spankings at home. And like, like today. Now, that was super commonplace when I was a kid. But I mean, the question is whether you'll, you let other people beat your children. <laughs> That's what you needed the permission slip for. <laughs> Parents had to sign off on, yeah, just beat the crap out of them. What does not kill them makes them stronger. I know. Builds character, right? Well, clearly, I didn't forget that. I vividly remember the walk. Like, I could see the classroom. Yeah. I remember where my desk was in that classroom. Did you ever eat cranberry? No, but I got beat three other times, or two other times in that class. I, we were grading, uh, we switched papers for a spelling test, and I decided I wanted to mark something wrong in this girl's paper, so I changed one of the letters. She had, like, the best handwriting in the class. I had the worst handwriting in the class. That didn't work out well. I don't even remember what I did the last time. She might have just done it because it was Wednesday. Years later, that teacher went to the same chiropractor I went to. You know, she was a little, little lady. That was... <laughs> 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 I should have just clocked her. Uh, that was like one of my, that was my dad's like favorite teacher I had. She yeah. But needs to have some sense knocked into him. To this day, he'll still talk about that. Like, you know, they should really allow that. So he sees my, his, his grandkids, my brother's two kids, and they're like, you know, they're animals. They're wild. Oh, well, at least let the teachers bring in some of those non-lethal weapons and shoot them with a beanbag or something. <laughs> Seven, seventh grader shot point blank range in the face with a beanbag. <laughs> oh, they should definitely not let me be like a superintendent of a school in some sort of foreign country with lax rules. <laughs> It would get entertaining quick for messed up people. <laughs> people with a little, a little skewed sense of uh, morality, I guess. Um, all right, <laughs> how did we go from <laughs> how did we go from printers, typewriters to now beating children? <laughs> it's, a, it's a natural progression. Um, okay, so in the early '90s, when businesses started having, you know, it was common for them to have computers. Day one, they were probably using these guys for word processing and things like that. But what do you think they eventually started using computers for? What else do we use computer for, computers for other than word processing? Okay, storing files. So that probably starts off locally, right? So not only, you know, when you think back to the typewriter, you know, not only did you, could, could you write one paper or one document or whatever and print it out, hopefully error-free or, you know, at least significantly easier, just had to hit print again instead of type the whole thing out again. But now you could store those files and you could have your last 30 papers there. Where back then, if you had a document that you needed to give a copy to somebody that you typed, you had to type the document again. Does that make sense? Can you even imagine that? That was so commonplace once upon a time. Yet it seems so foreign to us today. And it was commonplace not that long ago. Um, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Yeah, 25 years ago, that was common. So, yeah, that's a quarter century. You're getting old. I am. That doesn't, that doesn't seem that long ago. Now I'm depressed. Um, okay. So anyways, we store files locally on our computers. What else do we do? Let's try to think in terms of not internet. How many of you have a little network in your house or apartment or whatever where you have a couple of different computers hooked together? We'll even, we'll even allow you to say you have wireless and you know, computers can share stuff with each other through wireless even though that didn't exist back then. I mean, do you think that started becoming fairly common where you'd have servers, a computer, we call it a server, a computer sitting centrally in the office, 
that all the other computers were linked to somehow. Um, and maybe all the files associated with the business were stored in this one computer and all the computers could access them somehow. I mean, you could see that being kind of the natural progression, right? You know, where you might have multiple people each working on a computer rather than just being the office computer. It's like, oh, I need to type something. When are you going to be done with the computer? You know, that, that also used to be commonplace. But now you're at the point where there's computers in everybody's desk. You have a central server where everything lives. And now you need to uh, uh, be able to talk to that. How important was networking to the, maybe the growth of computers? So back then, do you think it was a better reason to have drivers to support emerging networking technologies or to support emerging graphics cards? Probably emerging network technologies. So really the driving force for drivers was this idea that networking was taking over. A version of Windows called Windows 3.11 for work groups specifically had built in networking stuff because that's when it was becoming, you know, this whole idea of a work group was becoming a uh, uh, commonplace where a work group is essentially a local network. Okay. Um, but before that we had emerging technologies. So there was some competing networking technologies. Today we just think of a network as a network. There's been a winner, right? Well, in, uh, you go back to the back of any of these computers, they all have big fat telephone lines looking, plugging into them. That's an Ethernet cable, right? And Ethernet is a networking technology. Well, do you think there was some competition before we got to Ethernet? Well, you, had, you had VCRs. Even within VCRs, you had, uh, I'm, I'm using a comparative type thing here, so you know, with, with recording and watching videos and stuff like that, we had VCRs, and even within VCRs, you had two competing technologies, beta versus VHS. VHS won, and that was the leader for a while, and then all of a sudden, you come out with DVDs. You know, then DVDs beat VHS, so all the, um, you know, movie stores, they started selling the DVDs instead of the VHS, and you actually saw the transition. You'd go into a blockbuster video or something like that when, um, uh, you know, when 90% of what they had in the shelves were VHS tapes and 10% was a little DVD section and they were a lot more expensive to rent. Then all of a sudden you started seeing that get to about half and half and then all of a sudden the DVDs took over. You know, and we're already seeing it again. If you go into a family video or something, there's not too many blockbusters anymore, but you go into a family video, most of the videos are going to be what? Blu-ray now, right? Or at least a half and half thing at this point. DVD versus Blu-ray. So you're, you're seeing the same transition again. So there's always a newer technology coming out, but we really actually hit kind of a wall with Ethernet. Um, that has become kind of the de facto um, wired networking technology. We're not working on better ways to do wired networking at a local level. They are working on better ways of doing wired networking um, at more of a, a, a global area network type idea, like you know the... the Cable companies for delivering internet to the homes. That's a wired network, and they're using different technology than Ethernet, that kind of stuff. Yeah? I'm not sure if they call it fiber optics or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is that better than Ethernet? Well, okay, well, it's, it's different. So uh, fiber optics would never really be used within a local area network. Um, probably the smallest network you'd have fiber optics used would be like, let's say a university that had, like, Western Illinois University would be a good example where it's like a, a much bigger place than Concordia here, but still kind of all housed on, like, a couple of city blocks. But you had separated buildings. So the connections between those buildings were fiber. Um, so each building had its own local area network, and then within that local area network, you had even localer, more localist or localer, more, more localer area networks. <laughs> I was trying to come up with a way to say that in the grammatically worst way. Um, and I mean that in a biblical sense. There's your, uh, right. That's the other half point. <laughs> so, um, but you might have the buildings connected by fiber. Um, so your question is, is fiber better than ethernet? Usually the answer is it depends. Uh, fiber has a, a larger bandwidth, 
So you can move things across fiber faster than you can move things across Ethernet. But um, actually, that's not, even, that's not even an accurate comparison. Fiber optics is the name of a cable. It's a type of medium for transferring data. Ethernet is the name of a networking protocol. The medium that Ethernet transfers over is twisted pair of copper. Um, Cat5. Cat5 cable, yep. So in, if you open up a Cat5 cable, you'll have eight strands of twisted pair. Twi twisted, uh, um, is it eight or is it five? It's four twisted pairs, eight total wires. So inside of an Ethernet cable, Cat5 cable, you'll have um, eight total wires, of which the Ethernet protocol, I think, only uses six. I think uh, gigabit Ethernet might use the extra two. So some of the protocols use more of it. But punchline here is you're really comparing fiber optic to twisted pair copper. You know, and fiber optic has a lot more bandwidth. You can move more data more quickly over fiber optic than you could over copper. Um, the protocol they use across the cable was still Ethernet at the time. But you might have buildings and stuff like that connected by fiber optic because, you know, you have all the data network, for all the data from a single building moving between buildings. You might want a bigger pipeline for, for getting that stuff to the next building quickly, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, but though you're not comparing network protocols, you're comparing the, the cables, which is actually, you know, a, a you know, kind of poignant to this, con this uh, conversation because early days of Ethernet used something called T-adapters. So Ethernet is a technology that's a broadcast-based technology. So if we just use this room as the example where it's a, uh, let's just say this is our local area network, and we have a um, switch in the corner, let's say. A um, bunch of different networking equipment. A switch would be one of them. Uh, before that, it was a hub. So we'll just use hub. Hub is the better example for, for Ethernet's early days. So we have a hub. So all these computers are plugged into that hub. And the, think of the hub like an interstate. So all the data is smashing into each other inside this hub. And hopefully, as data gets, you know, gets transmitted between the different machines, you finally get it through in you know, undamaged form, something like that. So... Ethernet is a broadcast technology. Everything is running on the same interstate. Well, before we had that idea of a hub, what you would do is you'd have all of these computers linked together in like a daisy chain. So each one would have, a, uh, would have what was called a T-adapter on the back of it. And you'd have the wire going from one computer to the next computer to the next computer. That was your highway. That was equivalent to what's inside that hub. And then at the very end, you'd have like it was a you you would stop the the terminal, so it bounce off the end and go back. So that was your interstate between them. So even within that, you had emerging technologies in networking. So back then, so kind of the punchline with this is networking was evolving very 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 quickly back then. So not only did we have some competing technologies, even within an individual technology, you had significant leaps being made in short periods of time. Much shorter periods of time than you had operating systems being released. And the business world, that is, the place, the, the, the world where the companies that are making operating systems are making their money, demanded that they be able to take advantage of these new technologies. So it ultimately came down to money. Who was paying Microsoft spills? The businesses that were adopting Microsoft Windows. And what do those businesses want? They wanted to be able to take advantage of the latest, greatest hardware. What hardware did they care about? Probably emerging network hardware to move data in their company even quicker. Because, you know, then it comes back to what do they say? Time is money. You know, imagine that a, uh, you know, a five-page document used to take hours and hours and hours to write. And if you messed it up, you had to spend hours again to, to recopy it. Well, then you go to computers. Now it's a lot faster. Well, now you might be collaborating on things across the network. Well, before you had the network, you had to uh, write it locally, store it on a disk, walk it across the building, give the disk to somebody else, and uh, they would put it into their computer and continue editing. That was collaboration. Well, now we have the computers linked together somehow. So we can actually collaborate without having to walk with a disk. So you just kind of keep, keep following the uh, going down the rabbit hole until we get to today. 
You just shoot an email to somebody or throw it in a Dropbox, send them a link. We're doing the same stuff. We just have new mechanisms for doing it, right? And those mechanisms keep getting quicker and quicker and quicker. Like, for instance, if you're going to share a large file with somebody today, what's the easiest way to do that? Let's say you have a 500 megabyte file. Yeah. Email is usually a 20 megabyte limit. So you have a 500 megabyte file. So a big enough file that it's, uh, um, you know, not ridiculous, but large enough. Um, a small enough file that's not ridiculous, but large enough that it, it will take time. And we, are, we will hit some limitations. How would you share a 500 megabyte file? <laughs> no, I'm asking you personally. I didn't ask you what's the best way to share a 500 megabyte file. I mean, are they, how close are they to me? Like okay. On a flash drive, gotcha. Like, Here you go. Good point. Good point. So if you both live on campus and you need to share a 500 megabyte file with somebody, you're probably throwing it on a flash drive and walking down to them, okay. right? Is that okay. fair enough? That's all fair. Saying you did, yeah. Okay. But, but generally speaking, well, I mean, at some point, you're probably, that's how you're going to probably get it to them, whether you do it right this second or, hey, next time we're in class, ask me for it. I'll throw it on my jump drive now, you know, that kind of thing. That's probably the way you'll get it to them. Okay. What if they're down in Illinois? So three-hour drive. Let's say they're a three-hour drive away. Mail flash drive. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you could throw it on a flash drive, then mail the flash drive. So now you're relying on the post office network, <laughs> the high-speed post office network, <laughs> for getting that 500 megabyte file there. Okay. How else might you get it to a person in Illinois? 500 megabyte file. Mm, I don't think VNC would really let you do it. VNC is uh, for to remote control of com another computer. Well, you can drag and drop, so that's a DCI. Yeah. Okay, so so you're talking about like a, a remote desktop type thing that allows you to drag and drop it. So it essentially would be a, a probably the technology would use would be FTP. That's what uh, I use with uh, a coworker that's in Minnesota. Okay. So using a remote desktop like that, when you would drag a file across there, underneath the hood, it's probably doing an FTP protocol, but to you, it's just, we're dragging it in there. Um, um, not, a, not, a bad, not a bad idea. Uh, what's slow about that? Chances are you're on a home-based, consumer-based internet connection where your upload speed's significantly slower than their download speed. So they're actually going to get the file much slower than they're capable of getting the file because they can only grab it as fast as you can upload it. But still, it's relative real time. Not a big deal. 500 megabyte file, open up the connection, uh, run to the, you know, run to the store, whatever. You know, an hour later, it's done. Something like that. Okay, not a bad, not a bad choice. What would be another option? Hoping to Dropbox. Well, minimum is two gigabytes, right? Okay, throw it in Dropbox. Now, with Dropbox, you still are going to experience your upload speed, right? But it's in, you know, the end user is not experiencing your upload speed in real time. The end user will ultimately be experiencing Dropbox's upload speed, which is probably much faster than your consumer internet's upload speed. So what you would do is you would put into Dropbox your 500 megabyte file. Maybe it takes an hour to upload it there. Then you'd send your friend the link um, to that file. And they can download it at probably substantially faster speed than they would have if you sent it to them directly. Okay? Any other means by which we can do that? Put it on a floppy disk. Floppy disk doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and they only hold 1.44 megabytes. <laughs> so you could put it on a CD, which holds 640 megabytes. Carrier pigeon, <laughs> super glue it to a, a pigeon's ankle. Do pigeons have ankles, or is it just a leg? Well, I'm sure you can make an argument. Well, I don't know if there's a pivot there. An ankle would be the pivot, right? Do they? Seems like you know a lot about birds. I was just assuming because like, <laughs> their feet can move up and down. So oh, can they? Are you sure their feet can move up and down, or is it just kind of them? Well, they, just, uh, they fly. Their feet aren't just like out. Maybe those are knees or hips. What's the pivot? Yeah, but there's three different pivots we're talking about there. We're talking about the hip pivot. We're talking about the knee pivot. We're talking about the ankle pivot. Human beings have those three, but birds might not. Well, they have something equivalent to their ankles. So it's just a backward bending leg joint. All right, I'll...
I'll accept it. <laughs> That's going to make the final. <laughs> You're a pigeon. Do you have something that passes for an ankle? <laughs> um, okay, so we already see that modernly we have mechanisms for transferring things um, uh, from one place to another. Now, realistically, though, isn't the entire network here connected together? So why couldn't you send a file to somebody else who lives on campus through that network? That's what networks are for. Don't they not have access to the one on one? have access to yep, so, so there's firewalls here on campus, right? They're actually taking something that would allow that to be an easy job and fast. And they're making it harder on you by putting restrictions. Okay, so, um, you know, but the point is we can see how those things are convenient things. Consider back in the early 90s, a 500 megabyte file, you might as well be saying, I'm trying to transport a planet. We didn't have anything that could hold, you didn't have a hard drive that could hold 500 megabytes. They didn't exist. In 1996, my DX2 66 megahertz computer had the biggest hard drive that was out, and it was 420 megabytes. I could not have fit, I could not have fit a 500 megabyte file on that entire hard drive. Um, so you think about how much we've evolved down those lines. But certainly in the early days of computing, the thing that drove drivers was the advent of networking. Because what drove the operating system makers was money. Where did the money come from? It was the businesses. What did the businesses want? More convenient ways, faster ways to, to deal with data so that they can make more money with less, less personnel or less work. That makes sense? All right. We'll come back on Monday and we'll keep going. Oh, see, that's what I was saying. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's not true. But human beings have three joints from the, from the pelvis down. We have the hip, we have the knee, we have the ankle. My question is, is how many joints do birds have? Pigeons specifically. They have a knee joint, I'm fine with that, but the challenge is whether or not they have ankles. It's a whole different, whole different